Yes, thanks a lot. And I mean, already Alexander's proposal uh, deserves, uh, mm -hmm. I think, some uh, discussion. And uh, so I'll uh, I'll start, and you give me a sign after 20 minutes because I don't yeah. see a watch here. And yeah. um, okay, I will. And uh, Maybe one only after oh, 15 minutes. And then <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and only to add that, because Alexander mentioned Andrew Duff, and you just mentioned Roberto Gualtieri. Yeah. Uh, the reason that I could not attend uh, this morning uh, session was that uh, we are working now on a uh, new report. I had a telephone conference with. Uh, three members of, of the parliament, two of them were uh, okay. Andrew and, and Roberto on this, and we were work, working mm -hmm. on it uh, together from different places. Um, actually, mostly from Italy, because Roberto is in Piacenza now, yeah, and yeah. I'm in, in Firenze, but I couldn't see much of Florence. So, uh, yes, and the idea was uh, science and politics certainly sometimes live on different banks of a river, but uh, should have enough uh, knowledge of each other and should uh, participate in discussions, vice versa. So that was the idea uh, to come here and to talk a bit about where we are now as the European Parliament concerning uh, legislation on European elections and related issues. I think that's interesting for you as information, and then I would like to, to share some maybe additional thoughts with you, and then we have some time to, to discuss. Uh, so, um, first of all, I think uh, to, I mean, many of us are concerned now about the voters' turnout in the elections 2014. Uh, in previous elections, uh, it declined from election to election. Uh, the European Commission will, and the Parliament, will spend a lot of money for a huge campaign trying to, to raise awareness of voters. I think the most important thing that we can do as legislators is to strengthen the, the ties between elections and European politics, because I think for a, a citizen, the most important question is, uh, does it make a difference? So what is uh, the result of my vote, uh, can I change European politics by voting or not? And the closer we make uh, the ties between elections or electoral results and, uh, the, and European politics after the elections, I think the more interesting it is to vote. So this is a general thesis in the beginning. Uh, we have made several attempts to, to, to improve that. Uh, I only very briefly want to come back on Andrew Duff's proposal for a transnational European list, because Alexander already mentioned that, and I'm sure that you all know this uh, proposal. It, is, it has not been voted finally in the European Parliament, because it was foreseeable that uh, there was uh, strong support, but not enough. There would have been no majority for that if we would have voted it. So it's still pending. Could every day be brought on the agenda, but will probably not if, uh, if the situation will not change. On other issues, I think one very important issue is the allocation of, seat, of seats within the European Parliament. Right now, this is always the result of deals being made in the Council. And as you know, the treaty says we have 750 members. Right now, the actual figure is 700, 750. The actual figure is 766, 11 of them from Croatia. But these 11 Croatians are not the only reason why we are above 750. So we had to reallocate the seats within the parliament uh, in a way that it will be 750 after the elections of 2014. And I was very unhappy to be part of that game because this was a game with many quite national arguments. It was, uh, we need one seat more, and if you Let's make an alliance so you get one more, we get one more against those, and so on. So my uh, 
attempt was to say this cannot be the way we deal with that. It, it cannot always be the result of political deals. There must be a clear rule on that. And this, I think, is important also if it comes to the citizens and if it comes to constitutional courts. Uh, I think without a clear rule, uh, without a clear formula where everybody can uh, calculate how many seats you have uh, related to the number of inhabitants, uh, uh, this, uh, we, we will not have good prospects for the future. And I agree with what Simona Piatoni said, that uh, it would not make sense to have a direct proportional allocation of seats. It should be a digressive proportional one. And we have, two, we have discussed two formulas. One was the one brought up by Andrew Duff, the so-called Cambridge Compromise, which uh, in order to not to spend too much time on the formula, I just show <laughs> it, which goes like that. You have one pillar like this, then you have one pillar like that, then, then it's like this. And uh, we then made another proposal, which I think would be more fair because it's digressive proportional in every point of the graph. It's not uh, like this, then like this, then like that. It's like this. But we left that open. There was no uh, possibility to get uh, a clear vote on that in Parliament and the Council before the elections in 2014. So what we did was we limited our acceptance of the actual uh, procedure uh, until 2015, so the year after the next European elections. And we, uh, we came to an agreement with the Council that after that, the allocation of seats in the European Parliament should be dealt with in a European convention by an intergovernmental conference with the aim to come to a steady, sustainable, and clear rule and not deals uh, for the future anymore. So uh, this is uh, on the seat allocation. Um, what we are now working on is the uh, statute for European political parties. And this is a very tricky dossier. Uh, right now, as you probably know, we have 13 European political parties, but their legal uh, personality is under Belgian law, and the whole legislation on that is very weak and has been and will in the future be contested. We just had uh, a situation where a party in Parliament uh, wanted to uh, go for the deregistration of two other parties. Uh, Parliament stopped that attempt. Uh, but the situation that the Parliament itself decides on which parties should be registered and which parties not uh, is not a very wise concept, since the parliament is uh, composed by political parties and it will, it will always be understood as uh, a matter of um, one, the interests of one party against another. So what we're trying to build up is an independent authority that deals with that. In the trilogue, uh, we have uh, we, we have no agreement, no final agreement yet, uh, but we have uh, a, an agreement on most of the related questions of registration of political parties, of deregistration of political parties, of the criteria and the process and who decides, but it's still pending and uh, the, most of the complications come from the council where there is no uh, clear position yet. There are still, uh, there are still a number of member states that object the whole, um, the whole dossier, so uh, we cannot move forward with that uh, unless this is solved within the council. That's on the political parties, and then um, I could maybe, let me just go a bit faster, um, maybe inform you that we very much changed our own rules within the parliament. So we adopted a new code of conduct on the basis of 
scandals like the so-called cash for amendment scandal and others, uh, now every member of the European Parliament has to openly declare all outside activities and all revenues or income from third parties, also all gifts or uh, invitations uh, and so on. So there is uh, complete transparency on that now and the Parliament has uh, built up a known committee that deals with these issues. I'm actually the, the chair of this committee and uh, in every meeting we have to deal with uh, cases uh, of uh, members. Uh, there are also sanctions uh, possible now, sanctions foreseen. So I think this is an exercise to regain trust and to have more transparency and uh, up to now it uh, works very well. So um, we have uh, less scandals since we have these new rules than we had uh, before. Let me add uh, some additional themes and thoughts because I think uh, elections are of utmost importance but uh, it is not uh, sufficient to have a European democracy where people have the understanding that they are part of Europe and they can share European decision-making. They have to have the understanding uh, that they also uh, can engage in European politics during or uh, beneath uh, elections uh, by different instruments. So uh, we have the European Citizen Initiative and you all know that uh, this, uh, in a way, works more or less well, but we had a lot of problems with the ECI, uh, with the rules for the ECI and uh, with ECIs. So uh, for the first half year, the system didn't work, the system that was built up by uh, the European Commission. Uh, citizens could not uh, sign, so additional time was given, and we now work on a stable uh, concept uh, and on less bureaucracy for the ECIs uh, in the future. We had one ECI that was uh, successful in the end, in, in the sense that you can already say that it made a change in policy. This was the right to water ECI. Uh, we have two other ECIs that were successful in the sense that, say, that they uh, managed to get the number of signatures required uh, uh, for ECIs. We will see the outcome with that then. Uh, we have not had hearings in the European Parliament on ECIs yet. This will start in February next year, and we are right now working in the Parliament on uh, these hearings, who should be invited, uh, what should be the framework, when should it be, and all these Questions. Let me uh, close with an outlook. Uh, what, we, what I was just telling you about uh, uh, the, the background of the phone conference and what we work on is that uh, the uh, coordinators in AFCO, in the Committee uh, on Constitutional Affairs of the European Parliament, right now work on a report uh, for treaty changes proposed by the European Parliament. It's not sure whether uh, we will bring this through Parliament, but uh, that's what we decided yesterday evening and started working on today in, in a way to sum up the work four years with the Lisbon Treaty and the years with the uh, Euro crisis, financial crisis, debt crisis, and so on, all the fire uh, the, the, the rescue, immediate rescue measures that were made to extinguish fire, we now should enter into a phase uh, where we uh, have more deeper uh, discourse about the future of Europe, about also the legal and institutional future of Europe, about how we can bring back all the competences that are now uh, divided in different uh, and sometimes also non-elected bodies under the, communion, uh, the community method and 
the legislation and the control of the parliament. This is the background of this work. And the aim will be to call for a European convention after the next European elections. So in the year of 2015, a convention to discuss about the future of Europe and about possible treaty changes. This is what I can give you as an insight from the work within the European Parliament in related issues. And now I'm, uh, I'll close here to have enough time uh, for questions and answers and for debate. Thank you very much.